have the roll call. Harlan Land. Here. Jack Looney. Here. Jerry Atkins. Here. Mark McDonald. Here. Joe Zach. Here. Larry Porter. Here. Rick Dreher. And Rick called me. He's excused. His wife is uh, having some x-rays on her back. And he somehow thought that was more important. And I uh, agree. So, yeah. Um, anybody want to move to... Uh, I'll approve the motion. minutes of the last meeting. I make a motion to approve the minutes. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions about the last minutes uh, or meeting? So minutes of the last meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Same sign. Uh, okay, reports. I guess we just have the one this time from uh, IPL and Mark. That's yours. Sorry, you, you, sorry. you ready to talk about the uh, the report that I submitted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you have any questions on it, then we can it, just to, I guess to start off. These are questions that you all had that had been uh, not answered to your satisfaction earlier, and uh, uh, Member McDonald had offered to highlight the items that were still sort of out there uh, unanswered. So what I attempted to do was to uh, answer those for you. So you have in your packet a memo from me to you uh, dated July 17th, where I attempted to answer the uh, everything that was outstanding. So uh, I think it's possible that, you know, it may not be that there may yet still be some questions. And so if you want to dial in some more detail you want, let me know and I can get it. Uh, for you for uh, further discussion, or if you want to talk about the answers that I provided there, I'm happy to to elaborate on them in any way. So however you want to go with this, um, do you want me to su summarize the question and answers, or do you want to just go right into questions on what you have before you, or how do you, well, any way you want to do it? Like, like I discussed a few minutes ago, um, I'd like the, the time to be able to respond to you um, on the specific uh, responses that you gave to us, and I probably won't be ready until the next regular scheduled meeting on that particular issue. But I do think that uh, we have enough information on the overtime uh, detail that we can discuss that today. That's just all I have on that issue. I do have some questions on on some of these, if, if we want to take up uh, some questions. Sure. Okay, on, on number one, um, you've um, identified that we have approximately $10 million in unassigned fund um, in the reserves, plus the $10 million for holding if, if AMI comes back. And you've provided several different uh, ways that 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 reserve money might be um, used, and I think all those are appropriate. I guess my my question is: It seems to me that if we have not not if I mean, we do have a reserve, and and you've outlined some potential uses of the reserve, that there ought to be a process and discussion as to which of your options IPL is going to pursue of spending that money. And I don't see a plan. I just see possibilities how that money could be spent. I don't know how, or how you're going to get or how we're going to get to making decisions on, on that reserve and what should be done with it. Well, um, just for the folks watching at home, because I think we do have uh, video working today, I think. I think Stephen's here trying to make sure it is. But, uh, yeah, the first question was options for dealing with the unassigned fund balance in excess of what our fund balance policy is for the unassigned fund balance. So the, uh, the fund balance uh, has four components. It's restricted, committed, assigned and unassigned. 
The unassigned part is the part that you have that there are no demands on it, and it's there in case of disaster. You can draw upon it. Uh, the city council has adopted a policy that you'd have 63 days worth uh, of money uh, on in your unassigned fund balance. So we have that. So the point that I was making in that response was, I think your question was, well, if there's, say, $10 million in addition to that minimum, what are some of the options that you could use that money for? And one of them has no, been suggested. You outlined the options. I just, my question is. I was just repeating it for the folks at okay. home, maybe who okay. didn't. So then my point was, is that, uh, that there's several options, uh, as, you know, as, as you mentioned, and uh, as to which one you would uh, do, I, I was asked for what the options were. You know, the council determines which of those are going to be done. And, you know, the, uh, they, they haven't decided yet what they're, what that would be. But my point being that, um, in my view, that uh, that money should be considered, uh, I don't even consider it surplus or excess because of the fact that we just signed a contract for with uh, Oneta to replace our capacity at Blue Valley. And it's a $10 million contract. It would seem to make sense to me if you have $10 million, don't go borrow $10 million when you have $10 million. So to me, I think that would probably be the first priority for that money. Uh, but, you know, there are other demands on the money even beyond that that I think should be realized. Um, and there's a um, uh, you know, the financial position right now of power and light is really not it uh, is uh, dipping into the fund balance for capital improvements. And, you know, this was mentioned to you when that cost of service presentation was made a few weeks back. It talked about how it's going to be necessary to draw down the fund balances because of the uh, capital needs you know, over the next few years. And then it recommended a, a, a rate increase at the end of that period. I think that the, what the council has signaled is they don't want to see a rate increase at the end of that period. So what we need to do is right-size the organization to try to avoid that. In the meantime, that money could also help us with these expenses that we do have. And number one is you know, we do have to we do have a contract that we need to think about so uh, about uh, paying for. So yeah, so I guess I would say that uh, the council will determine which of the what their priorities are and they has yet have as yet have not I, I think I, you know typically the council relies upon staff and the PAB to make recommendations and and all I'm suggesting is that you've got several options listed here and there ought to be an analysis of and prioritization of those options uh, to give recommendation to the council. You know, I think probably in the, the past that I've seen is when we had reserves, people say, well, that money ought to be given, given away because there's no plan in place. I think we need a plan. And I think that's incumbent of staff to recommend a plan that would come to us and then go to the city council. And I see that, and I don't disagree with you, and I see that as, uh, the first uh, shoe to drop in that regard is this rate rollout we're going to have later in the month. Uh, it's all tied together. The whole notion of uh, rates, it's not just a matter of uh, just, you know, what are we going to charge per kilowatt hour? You know, it's a lot bigger deal than that. It's, you know, it's a multi uh, leg stool, which is we want to have low rates, but we want to maintain high reliability as well, and we have to have financial sustainability, financial stability of the of the utility. You know, then on top of that, you throw in, oh, you'd like to have a simpler rate structure, and you want to make be cognizant of of the impact on our uh, lower income residents and customers. So it's you might say the five legs to the stool in that regard, but the three big ones we need to talk about is don't lose sight of financial sustainability. So when we're bringing out the new rates to council, it's they're going to be uh, comp more competitive than what we've had in the past. And uh, they are going to be geared, though, to allow us to have financial stability and which is necessary for the reliability. 
So it's all kind of part and parcel of that. And I think that um, we're going to, um, uh, I think that, I think what I was trying to do with this answer was you all asked what are some of the options. I was giving you some of the options. If you ask me whether, which ones are better, which ones are not, uh, or, and I can also tell you what we think the council should do with it in regard with relation to this new rate structure. Um, you know, so I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I think that if when you wait to see what the rate rollout is, I think it'll be sort of included in that. You see, that's ten million dollars related to the rate new rate re reduction. It's related rate in the sense of the that we need to have financial stability. Yeah. So um, we're right right now. Like I said, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that. Uh, as we've shown, there's fine. There is a um, uh, we are there, this year's budget has expenditures exceeding revenues. So whenever you're in that position, you need to correct that position. And in the meantime, funds that are available can help you bridge that. Uh, the new rate system that we're going to roll out, like I said, it needs to be made more competitive, but we can't make it probably as low as we'd like it to be because we also have to answer to the financial stability and the reliability demands on us. So this new rate structure is going to be trying to take it all into account. So when you talk about this $10 million, it doesn't make sense to add to the rates debt service on borrowing $10 million for the capacity contract. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Also, if you are spending more than you are than your income in a particular year for capital improvements, then you're drawing down the fund balance, such as as was recommended in that cost of service study you saw a little while ago. So I think we need to have a game plan. We're not wanting to do what you saw with that cost of service study. That was a particular vision of the future, which that's not the one we want. So to avoid having those future rate increases, we needed to have a, a structure that takes all these all these factors into account so that we can avoid rate increases in the future. So I think it's, it's all going to be part and parcel of it when we roll it out. So when we, new ha when we have the new rate structure, I still don't understand how other than, than not borrowing anymore. I, I understand the point that you're making there. I, I, I just, I, I still come back to the point that I was trying to make earlier. I think we, if, if some of this money is going to be used in relationship to the rate structure, whatever, that's fine. All I want to see is a plan so that we can t tell the public, yes, we have some reserves, but we have a plan in place for the next whatever years those reserves are expected to be there, that we're not just sitting on it and and then it can be used for anything that comes up. And we've already got a 63-day 63, 63 reserve, so that takes care of any emergencies that come up. I think we, we definitely need to have a plan for those. And if it's related to your rate structure, that's fine. I just, I just want to come back yeah. to that point. Well, I'm just trying to make the point that we do that we are planning for it. It's just that that wasn't the question you asked. Uh, and that question is going to be part of our answer to the council when we roll out the rates. It's going to be talked about in that context. But I mean, if, if you'd like to know what, uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to answer about that. It's just that isn't part of what the answer here was. You asked well, me for a I'm list just of options. suggesting the next step. So that I thought, you know, so I would just think that my point was that if you, you want to know what the options were, then not, you all form your opinions on it. And uh, that's all I was trying to accomplish was answer your question. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate you submitting the responses to us on it, even though it's, it wasn't really timely. Uh, the big issue that I have, in addition to the plan, and I totally agree with Garland on it, is what do you, is the plan on the expense side? We seem to forget about the expenses. We've had a plant that hasn't been producing electricity for quite some time, yeah. and we still have an enormous expenses coming out of that plant and also expenditures other than that that we need to address and reduce. I think the expense side will drive the reduction that will make even further reductions available for the ratepayers. 
Because yeah. that's really what we're, we're still over what we should be on the rate side. I don't disagree with uh, the infrastructure and uh, the plant manager that was here the other day uh, brought up about new transmission lines. Um, hopefully with the study you come up with to be able to get rid of the combustion turbines, which I'm very much in favor of. But we also need to be looking at um, attrition. We need to be looking at a probably a reduction in force making slots available for folks. Hopefully there's a citywide um, hiring freeze. I, I, that's what's gonna be need to take place in order to take care of the city employees and also to take care of the ratepayers. And they've been paying for a non-productive plant for way, way too long. And we need to see something happen in that regard. Well, I'd say that we don't disagree and that's all already in... Uh, Thank you. In process. I mean, I don't think anybody disagrees. Uh, again, though, you know, Blue Valley Plant, as we've we've talked about so often, you know, its value isn't so much how often it operates. It's the fact that it has the ability to operate, which satisfies our requirements for buying power so cheaply in, from the Southwest Power Pool. So even if it didn't operate at all, it would still be ser serving a big purpose, which is we can buy it from Southwest Power Pool cheaper than we can produce it. The, but you can't buy from them if you can't show on paper that you can produce an amount equal to what you use plus at your peak usage plus 12%. So we have to show that. And Blue Valley, allow, it produces a bunch, uh, quite a bit of that capacity that we have to show on paper, and so do the six CTs. So uh, what we all agree with and the studies have all shown is that there's a cheaper way to produce that capacity on paper than operating, continue to operate Blue Valley plant. So we, everyone agrees with you that we are going to need to shut the plant down. That's why we've made that contract with Oneta for replacing that capacity with a, a power purchase agreement. And uh, we've already reduced uh, production uh personnel down and once that finally is completed it'll be reduced more uh, but as far as looking at the expense side uh, very true and if you look at the uh, uh, one thing I did want to mention is that the six percent rate reductions that have been done are all tied to expense reductions they're they're not just done in a vacuum there's actually that much of of expenses reduced to offset it. So uh, you have to look at the expense side to do that. And one of the things that we're doing right now is the city has appointed a new uh, management analyst and uh, his job is to try to help find additional savings in throughout the organization, but including IPL and this is where he's starting. So uh, looking at things like overtime or any other types of expenses, we've already you know, as you know, Budget Amendment 12 that uh, the city manager uh, added to the budget when it was adopted, it had $5.4 million of expenses identified and redu reduced in the power and light budget that was adopted. That $5.4 million specifically identified so much that was coming out of salaries and benefits, so much coming out of operational expenses, and so much coming out of capital expenses budget. So... We agree with you. You've got to look at the expense side, and I think we are. And what, uh, you know, so I, I don't have any, really a disagreement with you, and we don't disagree about Blue Valley. I think we're all kind of on the same page, and that's the thing. I think we all know kind of the general direction we're going. I think we all agree. Well, before we move on to the next, all we're asking for, there needs to be a plan. Uh, with the ONET thing in place, with the contract in place, we need to have a plan with how we're going to handle all those employees that are no longer going to have functions at all, not yeah. even in pre preparation of if SPP decides they're going to call us and say, we need right. you to turn it on. Yeah, That's see, going to end very quickly. Yeah. And if yeah. we don't have a place for see, those places to go, it'll yeah. only be additional expenses yeah. that the ratepayers and we really don't disagree don't with you. Deserve. Don't disagree with you at all. And that plan is being developed. I just don't have, uh, I just can't really tell you what that is because it's being developed right now, but we're 100% agreeing with you and cognizant of what your point is. So, I mean, it isn't like you, the point's not well taken. We, 
we realize we have to have it. We keep referring to it as a transition plan to try to figure out how to do this in the right way. Mark, staying with question one, I have three quick ones, I think. Uh, how long are we going to maintain the uh, AMI balance before it comes back into the uh, operating funds? Well, uh, the, uh, you know, the city manager has not indicated to me how, when we would no longer have that as an assigned fund balance. Uh, assigned fund balance is not committed means the council has like awarded a contract. It's, it's an obligation. You're doing something. Assigned just means it's something you sort of identified a, a plan, a plan use, but it's, you're not committed to anything. So that's why I am, AMI would be an assigned fund balance. So until uh, we city, decide to do something else, it's there. Yeah, I think it's sitting there until such time as uh, the city manager directs that we do something okay. else with it. Uh, another question is, are we firm in our contract with Oneta? Well, we're firm other than the fact that they, uh, we have to have SPP approve that change of capacity. So we're waiting on them. We have, we have submitted. So if they don't approve it, we're out yep. of that contract? We'll have to come up with another one and we'll keep doing what we're doing until we have a capacity okay. change alternative that they'll agree to. But and uh, about the the uh, six uh, combustion uh, right. turbines that may cost $20 million, what's the plan for those actually? I mean, I they've been there for a long time. They're running out of time. Um, what are we, what's the plan for those? Well, this kind of gets into the whole about the rate reduction direction we're going as well. Everything is interrelated. And I'm sure right now, maintaining what we're doing now is cheaper than replacing them with new units and cheaper than going and buying part of another, replacing that capacity at a by buying into another power plant or something like that. It may be that it it's probably really comparable and maybe somewhat more expensive than buying another power purchase agreement, similar to what we currently are looking at with Oneta. But we have not actually gone out to to uh, see about buying that. What I'm saying is, is that what we're doing right now is is pretty low cost for that capacity right now. Um, but. That's why when you made your motion last time that said to look at options for it, we don't disagree and we're doing that and that's a thing that needs to be determined. But there's also offsetting concerns that need to be addressed that if you eliminate all on-site capacity, mm -hmm. then some people would argue that even if that was the slightly cheaper alternative. Maybe it's not a good one from a point of view of being able to be self-sufficient in, in, in a disaster or something like that. Uh, that N minus two reliability that they talk about, which one of the th reasons you know, we have this award-winning level of reliability. So um, it has not been determined yet what to do because right now they are, they are still Operating and they satisfy the capacity requirements, which is their fi their primary, uh, you know, uh, objective. Uh, but uh, just as you kind of pointed out in your motion last time, you could look at like, well, if you had new reciprocating engines, and even if they cost the debt service on them was twice what it's costing us for personnel and maintenance on the existing units, maybe you s s sell that. Maybe they get called on by SVP and they end up selling this energy and maybe you end up coming out all right. Uh, it, it's a pretty in-depth evaluation that has to be done. But uh, right now, that's a very inexpensive way to, ha to make 90 megawatts of, or to satisfy a 90 megawatts of capacity requirement because uh, just uh, we could do the quick math on it, but, uh, you know, replacing that with, New units at that price, obviously, look what the debt service on that would be. And then it, let me just ask, I just want to make sure if SPP says that that's not a good deal or whatever, 
we're out of that contract. All right, we'll have to do something else. Okay, well, I've got a trip planned to Little Rock. <laughs> well, okay. I uh, I think that uh, the I, I don't think that there's much uh, from what we've heard. I don't know if that's going to be a big worry, but it's uh, it's definitely not official until it's official, you know. So we won't know for six months at least and longer before we know for sure whether it's approved. And so uh, we've sort of put out there that um, okay. Blue Valley would probably the early, you know, it'd be closed sometime yeah. this time, you know. Jack, do you have questions? Next okay. summer. Okay, one. Okay, let's go this side, please. I I want to go to overtime. That's not a, okay. He's ready to go to overtime I, too. I let's, okay, other, let's do this first. One. Uh, we received some information some time back on on the. Um, uh, in, income versus expenses, the net income uh, for the last several years. And when I looked at that, if you take the last four years, last year we had, this would have been not, not the current last year, not 2018 19, because we haven't seen the income and expenses yet on that. But the previous year, we had a good year because it was hot weather and we made money. The previous three years, IPL lost money, and the average loss per year was $9 million. Now, if, if we continue at, at that rate, we're gonna wipe out that $10 million very fast. If, if this last year we lost $9 million, I don't know what we lost or gained. Well, yeah, see, but, that's that's but, kind of part of the point I was but, making but about. But the point is, I have never heard a discussion of how we're, how we're going to balance our books. I mean, we're trying to balance our books now because of the rate decreases, which we have to do. But if, if we don't balance our books on the projected losses, just the normal losses, because... Of, of our expenses exceeding expenses of income, we're going to wipe out all reserves very quickly. Yeah, see, uh, and then now there's a couple of points to be made in there. I mean, I think your your major point is the one that I agree with, which is that y there isn't such a happy uh, financial story here that you have money that I would call excess or surplus. However, let me just... Having said that, let me say about about that nine million. It's different to say losing money versus saying that your expenses exceeded revenue by an amount. And the reason I say that is that there is when I mentioned the four different types of fund balance. One of them is committed. Okay, you may have a committed fund balance where they have appropriated money in past years for projects, and that project continued on to a subsequent year. That money goes into a committed fund balance. Now suppose this year that project gets done, you may have expenditures exceeding revenue in that given year because you're actually spending some of the money you carried over from last year. So um, there are several projects that are of that kind uh, that are in this committed fund balance. Uh, the books don't show the money coming out of the fund as opposed to coming out of the current. You know, well, it seems, it seems well, see, this is what, I, what I'm saying is that it depends on how, if you're looking back at last year's expenses or if you're looking at the budget. So the budget, it would be coming out of not this year's revenue. It's coming out of prior revenues coming out of the fund balance. Right. So what I'm saying is you can spend money out of the fund balance and therefore that year revenues may have exceeded expenditures. So. You know, so, so having said that, uh, this particular this this year, uh, it's projected that expenditures are going to exceed the this year's revenue by five million dollars. Now, of that amount, uh, three of that is capital expenditures, which uh, you know, that's uh, you know that's uh, what you could do with that is that isn't as you could always cut out the capital projects, which they did cut it in half. And you do have capital projects that were carried over from prior years. So that could be, could be an offset. But um, 
I think the point you're making is, is that, yeah, you don't, it isn't that you have an abundance of, of funds that to get this right and do rate reduction, I think you have to take into account all your assets available to you and make this, to make this transition of where we want to be at the end. And uh, where we want to be at the end is, is to have the 63 day fund balance. We want to have reinvestment in capital that is equal to our depreciation on an annual basis. And um, you want to have uh, the revenues and expenditures even out, uh, except for where you have prior year fund balance from a, a committed fund balance being work being spent down. So you're projecting a $5 million loss. Well, when, loss is a, yeah, go ahead. When, when will we have the the uh, fiscal year figures? What's that? When will we have the fiscal year figures for last year? Uh, I'd have to just uh, ask the finance director that. I don't, I couldn't, I don't know when the, uh, that would be done. Okay, I just don't know the answer. That, right? Yeah, I don't, I just don't know the answer. I don't want to give you a bad answer. But, um, Mark, I appreciate all the efforts, and, and I'm going to I'm going to defer to this uh, sheet you sent out on salaries and uh, overtime. Uh, number one question is, what is there just a utility meter reader, or did what is a utility meter reader one? When I was there, you were just a meter reader. Is that something to just give them a raise or what? Yeah, I, I tell you, I just, if you, I can get back with you on that. I just couldn't tell you the difference between those classifications. So. Well, there's no other classification. They're all meter reader ones. Yeah, so. Is there a two? I think right, Larry. I think there's only one meter reader. They might have a starting rate, and I, I'm not that familiar with the IBEW contract. I could pull it up and look, but. Um, but the answer is they're just meter readers. Do you still have people down there, Dan, that are reading meters, or is it all so? Correct. There's still workers and IBEW in that group. It's negotiated through the IBEW, but there's half of them are still workers and half of them are uh, IBEW. Okay. And under the contract, are are the steel workers making less than the other, the electric? No, they neg negotiate the contract as one unit, okay. and then they. Whatever that is, is what the steel workers make. They still keep seniority in the steel worker union, and they can bid back over on the water steel worker jobs, but they're in the IV, the power and light TO and paid through that contract. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I want to get to how I had the meat readers for several years. How does a meter reader get ten thousand dollars in overtime? Okay, so the way their contract was negotiated again, I'm not in, in on the negotiations. I don't know the, all the details, but the way my understanding, when the meter readers are required to read, I think like five hundred meters a day, and they have cycles. We have cycles with yeah. books, just like when you were here. The only difference is, is now when they get through reading. This was before, after your time. So something was negotiated after. After Larry. LP. Yes, after Larry Porter. <laughs> so, so the new contract reads that they read their, but they're assigned that day, which is a book with over 500 meters, the way I'm understanding it, 500 reads. If they happen to get behind and need to read more books because either somebody's sick or injured or whatever the reason they don't have enough bodies to read then they would require to stay caught up and have billing still on track or if there was a holiday or rain or cold weather whatever would cause them to get behind then when they pick up and read another book they get paid overtime for it if it's the whether, same day they're working overtime or not yeah no if they're, they're they considered it overtime anything after they've read their they're assigned normal daily work. If they happen to go out and read a uh, another half a book or whatever it is, they'll get paid for four hours of overtime. And the same thing would happen if on a holiday or weekend, say they work, they work Saturday because they're behind. If they work Saturday, they read a book, they're going to get paid eight hours of pay. Is that, am I making sense? 
Well, yeah, in in some ways, but it sure does. I'm not saying I negotiated that contract. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, I, I, I hope not. Well, I, I thought because when you were working with me, uh, I had to keep track of my overtime, and I don't. I I see a, a, we're we're not keeping very good books on our overtime, and and to me, uh, wow. So as I understand it, if if they complete their 500 on a day's time, well, it could be it could be 700. Depends on how many of their books. A minimum of 500. I'm just making a number here that. So it varies by day. Well, yes. I mean, so a cycle in a book. Say you're out reading your neighborhood. The houses may be farther away than say you're reading an apartment complex. You might be able to read the book and cycle that they're. I don't know how they're broke out. They're, they're broke out to have an average of so many a day, and that helps us over in customer service because you only have so many meter readers, go, so many reads going out, so many questions coming back in, all that. Everything's like a workflow. But in this case, when they get behind, then that's when they... So, so as I understand it, whatever their book is for the day, if they finish their book, they get to go home. Yes. And they get well, to after go- 1.30. After one, yeah, they get to go home at one thirty. What time do they start? Seven thirty. So they basically are working five hours. Do they take a break for lunch? They could be done reading them in three hours, and nobody would know where they are. I mean, they're not required to turn in the books. They can't turn in their books any earlier than one thirty in the afternoon. So, so, you know, I, I last week I saw a, a mailman is out in the rain, pouring down rain. And he was delivering mail. I don't know if our meter readers were out there reading meters that day because it was pouring oh, down rain. Right you haven't heard of rain, sleet, or snow. Well, yeah. you can't be re- you can't be you can't be touching the meters and reading them in the rain due to the electricity. Number one, and the danger that you're going to run into out there during the rain. Uh, I've read the meters and I know what they're going through. I I I've never agreed with the one thirty. Uh, but if I was given the job, I'd be tickled to death. Yeah, I would too. Uh, but <laughs> I mean, there's potential what, for what slip I, and fall. But. What I'm getting at is, I mean, we, we really don't keep good track of overtime, do we? Uh, I would disagree with that. I mean, they're they're only going to pay overtime when those extra books have been read. Well, I understand I mean, that. It, the average but the they, average meter reader can read it their assigned work within eight hour period that they have. But more than likely, they're reading it in much less time than that to answer your, Whether you're seeing them, they're, they're coming in at 1.30 to turn right. the books in. They may be done at noon. <laughs> they could go home and take a shower and come back to work and turn their book in. Nobody would know the difference. I understand that. And they and that's happened, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but I just don't understand. That's quite a large amount of overtime to me. Uh and also, I wanted to ask you, Mark, is these uh, salary figures, is that benefits also in that figure or just dollars? Same. Payroll. Um, how about this one? I think that was one that benefits in there. It says all dollars is what I'm seeing. I yeah. would say that's, that would be overtime and everything. It appears to be a payroll issue. Yeah, we got this from payroll at your request, and uh, I think so that is just I dollars. Think that's, that's just not the dollars. Take home dollars. I'd say that's the total dollars. That yeah, would be, huh? so that would be. That would be benefits also. No, I would say not. Not the benefits. Right. It's just it's just their hourly salary right. and overtime. That's the way I'm reading it. I've just, that's the first time I've seen it, Larry. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know how to address it. The utility, I understand overtime for utility field service workers because they go out on emergencies and they turn on delinquents after hours. Uh, is that still out of your department too, Dan? It still ran out of power and light department. It's all, all this is run out of power and light department. Those folks are not under our. Okay. Direction. Do you but, have anybody working for you? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
All right, uh, that that doesn't satisfy me, but that'll do for now. Well, I think the point is is that you think that the that overtime is high, and we agree, and that's why that's one of the things that the management analyst is going to be looking at. But there's going to be a certain amount of overtime that's going to happen. It's just making sure it's not excessive. And well, so your point's well taken, and that's why I that's one of the that, things Mark, looking and, at. And that's why, and Dan knows this well. Rather than have overtime when I was there, at times we would – simply estimate a whole cycle well that's true and there's a lot of things were different when the missouri yeah. water company days i mean it's gone back a few years but in those days what we would do is reroute the books if an area grew had an apartment complex or something goes into it then you you change the 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 area that that meter book would right. then read in and so we constantly spread out all those meter reads over a you know, to where you didn't have too many in one book or too few in one book, so you didn't require it cut down on overtime. Right. Those type of decisions were made at that time, but it's different. It's a different contract. It's been negotiated through the years. I, I understand that, and I, I, I agree with you that we've increased apartments and stuff out east, uh, which, you know. People don't like to have their cycles or get used to when their bill comes in. Right. And I so understand. when you mess with those cycles, it – it, it causes <laughs> customer angst, but, uh, but that's how we did it. And I don't think it's, it's not exactly the same way now. Okay. But you probably have to, at times, redo the cycles, don't you? Yes. You would still need to do that on occasion. Yeah. But I since they're, I mean, since they're not having a problem reading them with how many they're supposed to read, it really doesn't make any, doesn't make a lot of sense to re change the cycles because if they're done and they're not required to work past 1.30 anywhere, turn in their work, they have to get their work done. I and if they that. don't get it done, then if it takes them eight hours to read them, some meter reader it might take three hours to read it, and it might take another meter reader. Let's say someone had, took them eight hours, then it, they have it. Right. I understand that. And I, I mean, you know, I, as I said, I had the meter readers for a while, and yeah, you yeah. probably teach me a lot about meter reading. <laughs> well, no, uh, but I have one more question for you, not on the overtime, but it just come to me. Somebody called me and asked me this the other day. Are we still, is the, your clerks over there, are they cl still collecting bad checks for municipal court? Yes, sir. Why? Just where they assigned the the. The bill, if you if you write a bad check, then in a city, it ends up in our department. It does? So you're collecting them for the municipal We send out the notifications. For any department. Pardon? You, do you collect bad checks for any department? Yes. We traffic or it doesn't matter. Wherever they, I mean, it almost has to be traffic or us. It's not, there's not a lot of other different checks. I guess if somebody bounced Are you bounced compensated it, out of that department back to you? The money that we collect obviously goes back to, say, it's municipal court. It would go mm -hmm. back to municipal court. And to, to answer your question, I mean, the way the customer services broke out, it's paid out of our fund, but we get reimbursed for power and light, water, and sewer. But to answer your question, I don't know as there's a little, that small amount of checks in relation to how many we get on a daily basis. I'm sure it's just absorbed into it. Well, to answer your question, no. Well, that's what I'm getting at. There, it seems to me, as Carlin said about the $9 million loss, there's a whole bunch of little things adding up to almost $9 million. If we're on this overtime and doing things for other departments, and if we're not getting compensated for it, you know, I, I just think we need to get a better hand on uh, – and you told me this, Dan. You told me I had to get a hand, better hand on my department at one time. That you was know, back then, So Larry. it's coming back to bite you now. Yes, so. yes sir. <laughs> That's so all I got. What goes around, huh? <laughs> what goes Joe, around. Could you have something? Yeah, I have uh, just two little questions here. Uh, is there any chance of uh, Power Light getting a new director? Well, at some point, yes. <laughs> well, it seems like. One of these problems to me is very apparent, just jumps right up, is that the inmates are running the asylum using a cliche. And you see why there's so much overtime. Uh, I believe that when this uh, MPUA was put, put in effect, that was to help out. 
And way back when, even when we went to Katrina, when New Orleans was completely done, we went down two weeks at a time and shifted out. And in about a month, month and a half, something like that, we were out of there. But enough people just shifted around. We have guys going on boats, going to another, well, not another country, uh, uh, U.S. proper territory. But I believe that this MPUA is meant to help out in this, uh, uh, helping out on these storms is mostly for these utilities to help each other out, mutual aid, not to go all over the world, so to speak, and see how much money we can make. And we should get a director in there that can pull in the reins on this. And well, let me just say this. Uh, city manager has directed that uh, there will be uh, more st stringent uh, look at responding to storm, uh, rec storm disaster requests. Uh, for many years, they've had a policy of, of being, uh, you know, responding to them, and he now wants to personally approve any uh, any response. So I guess if what you're wanting is more control over storm response, it's been instituted. Uh, the uh, and again, these numbers here are you know reflecting that uh, particularly big year. You know had that prolonged uh, hurricane relief effort. So um, he's wanting to uh, try to rein that back a bit. Yeah, a bit is good. But I think it should be a little, little more, a little tighter. Uh, like I said, we did Katrina, and we were nowhere near these numbers. Now that was a long time ago, but still, comparatively, ratio-wise, that you know, it wasn't, it wasn't this so out of sight. And I still believe that the mutual aid is meant for the utilities to help each other out, not to just see how much money we can make. Right now, and to that point, I think it's on. Uh, September 23rd, there's going to be a presentation uh, on mutual aid by MPUA that it's a joint meeting that the PUAB is invited to join the council to hear that presentation. It's been scheduled as of this morning uh, for September 23rd. So then you'll hear more about the whole idea about the mutual aid. And uh, but uh, I mean, your point is well taken. That's why the city manager is taking a uh, personal hand in approving these uh, responses from now on. We were supposed to have that mutual aid a couple of council meetings ago, but the mayor canceled the meeting. Yeah, so it just had to be rescheduled because, you know, we've got, uh, we're going to get past the rates roll out and then we'll have it. Yeah. 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 Garland's got the uh, floor. Well, I, I handed out, and yeah, I don't know if I gave you a copy earlier, but. I, I did. A, I tried to summarize the um, the data that you had provided to us on overtime, and and I don't want to in any way suggest that I am making a a judgment on that some of this overtime was inappropriate or not, because I don't know enough about overtime. But some of the things just leap out to me. You've got seventy one percent of your employees are getting overtime. That seems rather high. Uh, when you have 100% of your meter readers are getting overtime, that really sounds high. And I, I, I understand that it's a union contract, but I think that union contract needs to be torn up this next fall and start all over again. There's no reason for them to be able to go home at 1.30 every day because they put in their 500 or 700. They ought to be working eight hours a day. And, and, you know, if they take off when it's icing and storm, that's fine. And they can get comp time for that. But there's something wrong there that we have this much overtime going with, with meter reading. And some of these are clerical people. It's not just the guys out in the field, gals and gals. It's, it's the clerical people. I didn't break it down. But all, a lot of this overtime are, are clerks. Now, that really, it, again, I don't, I don't understand how you, you supervise overtime. But I think there has to be more supervision and policy change on overtime. When you have 
Um, at first, I thought, well, it's because we had a lot of people going down to Virginian, Virgin Islands. It turns out 80% of the overtime was done here. It wasn't done outside of, of independence. So it's a, I think it's a management issue that we're, we're allowing people to, to use overtime as best they can to beef up their salary. Now, that's, well, a, that's an assumption. I, I'm glad to hear that you're going to ask the management analysts to look into it. I think we do need to have some some other eyes looking at this independently um, to to see if there's changes that need to be made. But when you look at, at some of these numbers... Well, I think um, the one thing I was just trying to say is that I think what your point is, is that you're supporting change. You know, I'm trying to say is we're in the midst of change. So I don't... It isn't that we're saying, oh, my goodness, no, the status quo is what we want to do. We are fully in agreement of the need to make changes, and we are in the midst of change. So I think if so, maybe that could help further along the conversation that uh, you're not getting a uh, uh, objection from us on the desire to uh, evaluate overtime and make sure it's appropriate. Uh, we looked at, uh, I mean, we think that overtime is probably a little a few percentage points higher than in other departments, but that's where the management analyst, we really need somebody to go in and research this stuff out pretty thoroughly. And that's what he's, one of the things he's been assigned to do. So we're in the, in the midst of uh, uh, change and trying to right size everything. And same way with the expense side, like I said, we're looking at trying to see where we can cut more so that we do not have uh, so we can have that financial stability when we come out of the end of this whole process. And so uh, I feel like we're making some of the changes that you have suggested. That's what we're trying to do. Well, I, th I think the only thing that I would offer is I think you've heard a lot of comments from here that if, if it's going to require changes to the to the union contract, which it probably does, that as a community, we're saying we support you. You're not on your own for management because that's going to be difficult. But the community is demanding it of it. That's all I'm saying. And I think there needs to be some policy changes also, some supervisory changes also. You can do that internally. Uh, you know, I think once you've worked through this over the next few months, it'd be well to have a report that comes back to us and said, you know, what changes you were able to accomplish and, and how you anticipate that that's going to, to save run money. Now, right now you're running about, my approximation is about $2.1 million of overtime outside of the Virgin Islands overtime. You know, if you can just cut that down by 20%, you know, that's, you're going to have a half million dollars or so of potential savings right there that um, I think can be a, a significant savings for the for IPL and the water company. So no. you're, you're correct on the Garland when you you'd have to change the contract. I mean, if you said that the average person could read 800 meters a day, then that would have to be what the how how many meters could an average person read in an eight hour period? Well, that would cut down on number of employees that would be needed, and the overtime also. So and there may, has to be some time studies. So you got good data when you go back to the union reps and and say, look, we we've walked it. We can we can do well. The other thing is, if there's a, it's a little difficult to tell when if they're reading a meter now. If there's an incentive to them to get done early, then they're probably going to. I don't know if you want to run run it, but how would they get through that? Would a typical person walking on a regular rate, how long, how many could they read? Larry, you can have a better feel for this than me, having done that for some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't know if you, Larry, you can remember how many was a typical read for. Uh, meter readers. That's the type of thing you'd have to get into because if there's incentive for someone to get done early, then they're liable to jump fences and do whatever they can to get done early because that's the incentive. I mean, they're going home early. Yeah, back on on these uh, this overtime and so forth. Uh, I think Mark brought up earlier a power plant operator. They're getting overtime. They're not producing electricity down there, as, as I know. Power plant shut down. Well, no, whenever they get called on, they have to respond and fire up. 
So, well, does that happen often? Or I mean, as far as I know, they don't even use coal down there anymore. So uh, they don't they don't use coal. But you know, again, I don't really want to just speculate on stuff that we weren't really prepared to to answer fully. So we could get you uh, a uh, more information about under what scenarios they have people at the power plant on call or having to come in. I just don't have that today and I just don't want to mislead or give you anything, make guesses that I don't like can't back up. Uh, two so three things, um, just uh, uh, a matter of cleaning up some stuff. Um, members have asked me uh, on a couple of occasions during the last month that maybe we limit our, our uh, responses and things to three minutes. And I know that that is not something that's going to be adhered to, but in the interest of time, uh, that might be looked at, except for, of course, uh, major presentations that are that are made or reports given, that kind of thing, number one. Number two, uh, they've also requested that uh, we limit our meetings to an hour, if that's possible. And in that case, we're moving right up on it. Uh, number three, is it possible to have a seminar for uh, the understanding of FERC, MERC, ONETA, and SPP, how those things relate and what we ought to know about it so that as we're chatting over here, we know a little bit more? Is there a possibility for that? The meeting on the 23rd will be uh, taking care of SPP and and really ONETA is just a, a capacity provider, which it's related to what we'll talk about with SPP. Issue. What's that? It's a ten million dollar issue. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, another little thing that's come up is uh, apparently we have some uh, audio and video problems in this room. And uh, it has been suggested by uh, some of our members and uh, council member that we uh, move our meetings to the city council chambers and we'd have to work out a time convenient with everybody, uh, i.e. Uh, some of the other committees, I guess, meet there and the uh, city court meets there often. So if we want to do that, somebody needs to make that uh, known a little bit better. And number five is... Uh, Mary Jeter is our secretary today, and so uh, we want to welcome her to the crowd and uh, thank her for her work uh, filling in today. And yeah, just raise your hand anytime after we've left, and we'll call on you. Yeah, all right, great. Um, anybody want to bring up any of those? Uh, let's talk. Let's look at the council thing. You mentioned the the FERC uh, seminar thing that's coming up. That's a good thing. Do we have a date for that? Well, I was uh, talking about the SPP and uh, yeah. MPUA. That's September 23rd. We don't have a. We can get a seminar on the on NERC and FERC for you. That's that, that we can do that at a future meeting if you wish. Okay, but September 23rd is a time we ought to have in our calendars. And time of day and where? It's city council meeting, six o'clock at city council chambers. It uh, it'll be a. Um, uh, it's a presentation. One would be the mutual aid MQA and the others talk SPP uh, folks. Now that's all subject to getting them all scheduled. That's, that was. Well, it's a tentative date for the moment. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Any chat about uh, moving yeah. our meeting to the council chambers? I, I think yeah, I'm fine here as long as we get the, I don't know what happened. I don't either. But maybe we just need to focus on getting that fixed first. If, if that can't be fixed, then we go to the council chambers. Okay. Anybody else? We'd have to be up to the city manager of staff to figure out a date or time. I know. I can address the council. Sure. The problem is that when Steve can't make it. Hey, it's really hot. So stand up. Thanks. I've, I've received multiple phone calls from citizens very upset that your last meeting was not online. And I, I, I investigated a little bit. And, and what, what the problem is, when good old Steve can't be here, plan B is for the staff to put in a flash drive and record it 
and also videotape it. Well, that doesn't always work. And I looked online and I saw two of your last 12 meetings, they only have audio. And I sat and tried to listen to one of your audio meetings without looking at the screen. You can't follow it because it's real easy to forget you have to talk into the mic. <coughs> And you talk with your front hands, and you also refer to documents. And when you say, well, looking at this, no one can tell what this is. And so I contacted the city manager, and he said, well, maybe you all should talk to the PUAB yourself. Um, and I said, okay, I will. So I called the municipal court and said, when is your courtroom available? And it's always available Mondays. Always. Nothing is booked other than council at 6 o'clock. Um, planning commission is in there. Our study sessions are in there. Other groups meet, for example, youth court. And so I talked to Rebecca today to find out, can we have a set time? Thursday is not available. Your Thursday at 2.30 on the third Thursday won't work. It that they have court, and they can't kick court out. It's their courtroom. So that's the problem. Just a question. This is the, uh, are our meetings set uh, by charter? Anybody remember that? It's no. You set your meetings. Is this a suggested time? You set your meetings. You okay. do. Okay. And so anyway, I told um, the four citizens that called me that I would address it, and I'm addressing it. What you decide to do, you're the board. I just ask you to remember what you're dealing with is as important, if not more important, than Planning Commission. Planning Commission has been televised for years. I don't know why we don't televise you live. I think it's important. And I know Council Chamber, Chamber is equipped to record audio and tape. This room, no matter what we think, was never intended to be a recording studio. So it's not a staffing problem if we go to the, to the Council Chambers? No. In fact, it'd be easier for them, wouldn't it? It'd be easier for Steve. Yeah. Well, that's the question. 